as we get started here, my first question to you, does anyone just ever stop and think and just look at their surroundings, whether it's this classroom that we're in or just going outside and standing on a street corner and looking at the world around them and think, what a time to be alive. No one thinks that? Really? Yes. <laughs> All right, we have three people. Hopefully, we're going to convert you by the end of the session. That is the aim today. And so just to give you a taste of how amazing um, science and technology and discovery is, I want to tell you about this bit of research coming out of the University of Washington. This is an article that came out last September in 2013. Uh, basically, the first ever known instance of mind control. Basically, what researcher A on the left did was is he thought he, he attached electrodes, an EEG device, to his brain that could read the, the um, electric output. And he thought of firing a rocket in a video game. And then those electric waveforms were interpreted by the EEG, connected by internet to his research partner across campus, who was connected in turn to a TMS, or transcranial magnetic stimulation machine, which were able to interpret the electrical uh, signals and then enact that, making him involuntarily push a button, push the space bar in the computer game he was playing, and fire a missile in the game. And so, by thinking about it across campus, one guy was able to make his research partner fire a missile. And this is the time we live in. Mind control that was once uh, in the realm of science fiction is now coming to fruition. So the three theses I want to leave you with today are this. It is A, an amazing time to be alive. This, right now, is the age of discovery, and there has never been a better time to create. And there's a quote by Tom Edison here that says, to invent, you just need a good imagination and a good pile of junk. And so if you want to tune out for the rest of the lecture, as long as you remember these three things, then I'll have done my job today. The title of my talk is called Engineering Tomorrow, subtitled Fostering Culture of Disruption and Innovation. And basically, I want to talk to you about the, the constant stream of innovation and uh, technology that we live in and the mindsets that lead us to get there today. And so if you're still kind of doubting me, I want to, I want to prove to you that there is potential in everyone and everything. And to do that, I want to introduce you to Makey Makey, which is a product that's come out of the MIT Media Lab with basically the thesis that everyone everywhere is a potential inventor. So basically, you don't need the sound unless you want to hear some cool music, but the concept is that, that anything in the world around you can become an interactive device. And so what you see by simply uh, hooking up alligator clips to a USB component, they've made Dance Dance Revolution out of a pile of buckets full of water. Um, or you can see here that uh, not satisfied with a regular piano, they've made their stairs into a piano. And um, st the sound would be more useful here for the piano. But um, even in this next scene, you can see that uh, they've created synthesizers or keyboards out of pianos, out of humans. And in this, in this last case, by hooking up these alligator clips to a computer and uh, a water bowl, they've made a cat photo booth. And simply by, by taking this, uh, this philosophy that A, everyone's a creator, and B, the world is your playground, uh, this, this, pro this program called Makey Makey came straight out of the MIT Media Lab. All right, so uh, that's, the, that's, the context, that's the context in which we're gonna talk about today. But let's move on to introductions. My name is Shauna Pandya. I am currently a resident in the um, Division of Neurosurgery here uh, at the University of Alberta. I did my med school here. Uh, I have a pretty interesting background. Um, most people kind of look at me funny when I tell them what I've, what I've uh, dabbled in. So I've done my master's in space studies at the International Space University in Strasbourg in France. I've uh, previously carried out research at the European Astronaut Center and at NASA in Houston. I've carried out research in the realm of space technology spin-offs um, that have uh, everyday applications in medicine here on Earth, and I've written a book chapter on that. I've been involved with TedMed as a frontline scholar last year, and I've also previously founded a company uh, based on a challenge to positively impact one billion people in 10 years at Singularity University, and you'll hear more about that later in the talk. So I just wanted to give you a little bit about my background. 
we have three theses. I want you to just keep in mind, the world is amazing, and that everyone is a potential creator, and the time to do things is now. Okay, so I want to talk about transformation first. When I first started this lecture, I asked you to, if you'd ever engaged in the thought experiment of just marveling at the world around us. And so it's wet outside, so we'll have a road indoors. And I just want you to marvel at the road. Has anyone ever just stood and thought, what a human feat of architecture and engineering? I don't know about you, but my mind is always just a little bit blown when I think of the concept of a road because this is something that has physically transformed the very geography and the landscape of the world around us. If you were to have bird's eye view and go up in an airplane, you would see that the very landscape of Alberta, of Canada, of the world in which we live has been transformed by the concept of a road, by getting us from point A to point B. And why did we, and, and why did we, someone see fit to transform the, the landscape uh, in which we live? Here's another example of how we as innovators, as technologists, as humans have shaped our world. This is a, vi a, a, a map spread of the earth at night um, taken from space. And you can see that if any other sentient being were to pass by our planet, there is, they would know that, hey, there's someone here because the world is literally lit up across wherever uh, major human hubs are. So that's, that's uh, Henry Ford. He's, uh, he's often confused with being the man who invented the automobile, but he's actually the person who popularized the automobile. So the first concept of an automobile was actually devised in the late 1600s, and the first prototype was made in the late 1700s. So he was by far not the first person to create the automobile. But he built on the concept of, on the shoulders of those who'd been uh, ahead of him and developed that concept. And his innovation was not to invent the car, but to mass produce it. And so he was able to make them at greater volumes and in better working conditions and make them in a way that was affordable for, uh, for the average US citizen. Running along this theme, so that's Thomas Edison. And again, so he's often credited with inventing the light bulb, and he, cre he created the first functional light bulb, but he, again, wasn't the first one to attempt this. There were dozens before him who had created, who had invented, who had tried building a light bulb, but uh, his innovation was to, create, to insert a tungsten filament into the light bulb uh, and, to, and so that it wouldn't immediately burn out upon, uh, upon uh, hooking it up to a circuit. And so the point of these two examples of Edison and Ford is that A, no one got to where they were by living in a vacuum. No one suddenly woke up one day and said, aha, I should build a car and then that's what, was, that's what happened and that's how uh, the world was transformed. But rather, if you look into the history of it, these came after, in the case of the car, centuries of experimentation. And then all of a, someone, all of a sudden, someone had an aha moment and then went one step further and built on what went before. Um, in the case of the light bulb, Ed Edison was amongst numerous contemporaries who were trying to fiddle with this idea of uh, a 24 seven society that didn't live by sunrise, sundown, and uh, trying to create uh, something that could provide illumination around the clock. And so the other concept I want, to, I want you to take from these two studies is that it took a while, but now we literally have two inventions that have transformed the way we live. We no longer have to live within walking distance of our neighbors, our workplace, our, our, our food sources, our sanitation sources. Um, because of transportation, we can, because of the automobile, it, distance is not a factor. Because of the light bulb, we are able to live beyond nine to five in the winter, although some of you might not want to, um, or and live, live in, the, in, the, um, at an, in nighttime outside of natural light. And these are, these are other examples. So not only have we taken this concept of a 20th century automobile, we now have hybrids, we now have different models, we have SUVs, we have sedans, we have compact cars. Taking transportation one step further, we don't even have to worry about land-based transportation. We have airplanes. 
that can take us from point A to point B. And now we have people taking that one step further and saying, what if, what if you didn't have to take a 26 hour flight from Los Angeles to Sydney, Australia? What if we had point to point suborbital flights and it would only take four hours to, um, uh, to get to Los Angeles, from Los Angeles to Sydney? And people are working on that. Um, many of you might be aware of um, private space tourism, especially this week because of the, um, the uh, tragedy with Spaceship Two. But people are working on taking transportation to the next level and making private space flight a reality. Even light bulbs have evolved. No longer are they tungsten filaments from, from uh, hundreds of years ago, but we have green, um, environmentally friendly uh, emission heat saving lamps. So the other thing I wanna talk about is, we've talked about where we've been, where are we going? So that's from Get Smart, and uh, that's, uh, that's a, a smart watch in which you can communicate, talk to, talk to a spy agency. On the far left there is a friendly letter, a uh, book that says, Don't Panic, and it's called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And in it, it uh, has all the information you could possibly want or, or need to know about any place in the universe. Uh, one of my favorite books growing up was called My Teacher Flung to the Planet, and in it, the, the uh, hero of the story has something called a URAT, which stands for Ur Universal Reader and Translator. Um, for those of you who were Inspector Gadget fans growing up, we'll notice in the lower corner of the screen, there's Penny's computer book. And the thing that blows my mind is that not only have we come to, a ch to realize each of the URAT, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the computer book, we've far surpassed these capabilities. We now live in an age where in the palm of our hands, we hold something that can translate for us, that can give us instant information, that gives us that, the ability to uh, locate needed, uh, uh, needed uh, um, resources or, or locations. We can do our banking. And so I put in the last corner just to, to highlight the point that we actually live in the era of smart watches and portable computer books. So if you're still not impressed, if you're still wondering, it's 2014, where's my hoverboard, if you're a Back to the Future fan. And so what you see here, and this came out in the last month, is the world's first working prototype of a hoverboard. And so the point is, we're living in a very dynamic world in which anything and everything is possible. If you can dream it, you can do it. And yes, for those of you who are wondering, that is Buzz Aldrin up there on the hoverboard testing it out at, uh, at Autodesk. And the, exam the world around us is just rife with examples of, of the way that technology and simple ideas gone to mass scale have changed the world around us. So vaccinations, um, smallpox is now a thing of the past, Vo polio is on the verge of being eradicated, hand washing, a simple, not high tech solution, dramatically decreased inf infant mortality rates in, in the course of, of simply years. Anesthesia has allowed us, to put, has allowed us, and especially within my field, to perform high intensity, very complex, very, very long operations, which you couldn't do before. In the past, before the advent of modern anesthesia, surgery was a theater sport in which it was really a race to the finish um, or until the patient passed out from pain while you were amputating his limb. Satellite technologies have revolutionized communications. Um, the internet. Can anyone here imagine what life without the internet would be like? Does anyone even remember what life without the internet, <laughs> internet was like? You do. I, I kind of do as well. I'm not, a, not happy to admit it. But here's a thought experiment. I came across this article last year. There's a Guelph family out in Ontario. They noticed that their two-year-old and their five-year-old were spending way too much time on their iPads. So the dad decided one day, you know, that's it. For a year, we're living like it's 1986. So not only did they get their mullets and old school mustaches, they got rid of their internet, they got rid of their phones, they got rid of their digital cameras, they got rid of their GPS systems. So for a year, this family, I think they just finished their experiment, was traveling cross country on using only maps. They were, their most high tech machine in their home was a fax machine. If their friends wanted to reach them, they had literally had to phone them or come to their door. Um, they had an old school Nintendo or Atari system, but that was about it. Um, to pass the time, they read books. For some people, this might be a horror story. For some people, this might be paradise. But in the sp span of two decades, we've transformed the way we live. 
Nor do I want, I want to assure you that we're nowhere near it being invented out either. So 3D printing is, since 2009, the past five years has made an incredible surge as an emerging industry. So it started with using a 3D printer. So, so the concept, for those of you who aren't familiar, is, uh, is inputting a set of parameters into uh, a computer and then giving uh, it a source material, whether it's plastic or, or acrylic, and then saying, okay, I'd like you to print out a complex artistic shape, which is what we have here with this, this uh, 3D ball. And then some people said, well, let's take it one step further. What if we can print useful things like food or organs or houses? And that's where we've come to today. Or what if we could just enable anyone to become a, a home-based print, 3D printer? And now there's 3D printers for the average person who wants to make things at home. So whether it's toys, um, 3D printing of organs, can you, can you fathom what the concept means that we would no longer have to wait for organ donor lists. People wouldn't die because they needed the hearts or kidneys or livers. We wouldn't have to worry about rejection or, or organ matches. Inventing houses. So this logo is from Akasa. There was a, a group of um, some friends of, of mine based out of Berkeley. Um, and they asked, what if we could use locally sourced materials and then take down the costs and the time by 70% and literally throw up a house in two days. Um, what would that mean for those who don't have a roof or who just have a tarp or a, a corrugated metal as their roof? Um, and so they're currently researching the technology um, of 3D printing a house and overcoming the problem of uh, being able to build, build walls that are more than six feet high. On the other end of the scale, what if you were able to manipulate the atoms themselves? So what you see here is a nanoscale um, resin-based replica of an Austrian church coming out of the Technological uh, University of Vienna, where they've actually managed to get 3D printing down to the nanoscale. What does that mean for medicine? What if you're able to print nano-sized robots or drugs or scalps in your system that can detect and stop cancers before they even start. This is where we are today. We stand at the edge. And for those of you who weren't terribly impressed by the hoverboard, if you want your flying car, that's also in the works. This is a company called Terrafugia based out of Boston, Massachusetts. And they said, well, you know, sometimes traffic jams are a bummer. And so they said, well, why not be able to fly over the traffic? And so they've just received their FAA clearance in the past two years, and they have a hybrid car that also um, doubles as a personal glider. What about prostheses? For years and years and years, the, the um, replacement for an amputee was either a hook or a non-functional prosthetic that looked like an arm but was non-functional. If you think about it for a moment, that seems incredibly unfair when you have to replace an arm that has the capacity of moving in ranges of motion. Just, just look at your hand for a second. I want all of you to do this. Look at your hand and then just experiment with it. You can move up and down and side to side and you can move your fingers. That's 11 degrees of motion right there. You can, you can sense things. You can feel the dust. You can feel warm or hot or cold. And not only are you deprived of this, but uh, your replacement is non-functional. And so DARPA, the Defense and Research uh, uh, organization of the military in the States realized that a lot of their veterans were coming back with, um, from war with these horrible injuries and they wanted to do something um, to help their, their amputees. And so they launched these competitions to revolutionize prostheses and this is what they've come up with so far. So now this gentleman has an arm that has range of motion at the elbow, at the wrist, at the fingers. He can pick up a coffee cup and drink from it. He can pick up a tennis ball. He can, in fact, catch the tennis ball. And he can also respond to items of different weight, of different, different velocities. And this is one of the first iterations of the robotic arm. And now they have, um, they're working on a second uh, generation that can also have sensory feedback for temperature, uh, and, and touch. 
And so that's, that's where prosthetics has come to today. Similarly, along the lines, uh, along the lines of medicine and uh, those who've lost use of their limbs, what about paraplegics, those with spinal cord injuries or degenerative de diseases of their, their spines, of their, of their muscles and their limbs? So there's a group out of uh, Berkeley, California, again, who's created an exoskeleton. So for those who've lost, who are, for a paraplegic, who've lost use of their lower limbs, They've created this outer skeleton, straps on like a backpack, total, pound, total weight distribution of 100 pounds distributed, and allows the, the user to, to walk again. For those who are locked in or quadriplegic and have lost use of all their limbs, this, this goes back to the mind control experiment we saw at the beginning of this class. Their researchers are now working on electrodes that interpret your, uh, your intention from your supplementary motor cortex and then translate that into movement from robotic arms. Um, so not only are these things, these, these ideas and these concepts in medicine and prosthetics and, and uh, uh, technology for paraplegics in the, in the works, but they also have real life application for um, people with debilitating medical diseases. So we're going to switch track for a little bit, and we're going to talk about the Mars One project. This is uh, this is a concept um, that plays on crowdsourcing and the pro the power of media. the The concept is that uh, it's about time we've colonized Mars. Why haven't we done that yet? And so, in um, in I think late 2013 or late 2012, they had over they just throw out a wide casting call saying anyone who would be interested in taking a one-way trip to Mars and being the first settlers on Mars, send in your application and uh, we'll, we'll uh, start narrowing down the process. And they received over 100,000 applications for people who are willing to take a one-way trip to Mars. The concept was, we haven't done it yet, but we should. And so, and we think people would be interested in this. So why not just throw it out there and ask who's interested and then let the, me the ensuing media and media storm uh, be our way of funding this, because that's been one of our limits all the way. And then, you know, we can work in parallel on the pro problems of technology, of living space, of uh, sustaining our, uh, of creating a sustainable base. Switching tracks now to the uh, realm of material science. So this here is a piece of aerogel. It's also known as frozen smoke. It's the world's lowest density solid. It's 96% air, so featherweight. And if you held it in your hand, you would, it, you would be low, have a hard time seeing it. It's kind of like styrofoam, it can crumble, but it's also like a super ant in that not only can it withstand much more than its weight, it can withstand up to 4,000 times its weight. So you can see here, this brick that looks like it's balancing on nothing is actually standing on a piece of aerogel. Again, Virgin Galactic is trying to make private space tourism a reality and these aren't pie in the sky ideas, and this past week in the media just reiterates how, how real the challenges are in trying to get there. And so, just to summarize some of the trends we've talked about, we've talked about 3D printing, the trends of, in medicine of the potential of unlocking uh, the, the ability to 3D print cells and organs, um, or at the other end of the spectrum, being able to master nanomedicine and deliver, deliver pharmaceuticals, uh, send, out, send out scouts the size of cells that could detect disease before it even started. What are some other trends um, that are important? Um, I'd like to take a few minutes to speak about big data and, the, and uh, as a case study. So big data is basically a recognition of the fact that every single day we are generating massive amounts of data, and that data is only increasing exponentially. And so this, every single day, we put out 2.5 exabytes of data. And so that's 10 with 18 zeros behind it. And that's only increasing. And at the same time, the amount we're increasing isn't increasing at a linear rate. It's doubled, as well as our capacity to store data. In fact, um, we've been doubling our capacity to store data every 40 months since since 1980. And where does this data come from? Data is everything we are, we produce, we see, we hear data. It's text, audio, video, it's data logs, it's um, software, software backlogs. Everything and anything comes down to data. So what do we do with this? Because there's a lot of junk out there, 
but there's also a lot of value in being able to see trends amongst this, these massive piles of data. And so big data is the science of processing large, complex data sets uh, and looking and being able to process them in terms of variety, volume, velocity, and more importantly, veracity, figuring out what's useful and what's truthful. Um, it requires massive amounts of parallel processing. Um, and the ultimate end goal is to be able to process this data and then apply it for reasons of security, for improving internet search, for predicting finance, for being able to invest better uh, in the world of genomics, um, for, for interpreting our DNA, for figuring out what's junk DNA and what are useful genes, looking at astronomy, figuring out, um, figuring out the heavens above. Um, on my way to work this morning, I heard this amazing big t uh, TED talk on big data and astronomy, and that said in the past year, using uh, uh, big data, big science to process the amounts that are coming in from the uh, Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, we've discovered 512 planets in a year, doubling the amount of planets we knew previously. So that's the power of big data. So using this in the context of the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC uses 150 million sensors to deliver 40 million data points on over 600 million collisions per second. That is a lot of data. If you unfiltered that, that would be, that's 500 exabytes of data every single day or 200 times the rest of the data of the world combined. It's, I certainly don't have the capacity to process that. I just know that's 10 with a lot of zeros behind it. And so how do we make this useful? And so this is where big data comes in and this is where the need to filter what's useful and what not comes in. And so then the process comes down to filtering 99.999% of this data out and coming down to pinpoint those 100 collisions per second that are of interest and filtering out the other 150 million petabytes of annual data that's otherwise not interesting. That's a six million fold, fold difference in mining what's, what's interesting and what will potentially change physics as we know it versus what's not. So this is an example of the wins as well as the challenges that this new science um, it presents. And five years ago, if you mentioned the term big data, no one would know what you're talking about. Most people still don't know. If you, were to, if you were to tell people you're a data scientist, it's a legitimate field today, but most people still don't, haven't heard the term and five years ago it was non-existent. And so this just puts it in perspective, um, the challenge of big data. So the database of useful information maybe comes down to five kilobytes and the database of useless information comes down to 500 million gigabytes. So that's the challenge we face with data today. And so just to underscore this point, looking at data, texts, and trends, and how this is reflected to the real world and jobs around us, jobs that didn't exist 10 years ago. So before the advent of the smartphone, if you said to someone, you're looking for an app developer, what would that even mean? Um, we just talked about big data analysts and data miners. Um, this one I had a good laugh over because I still don't think it's a real job, but apparently there's millennial generational experts out there. This entire generation needs their own consultant and level of experts to decode them and figure out how they think and what motivates them. Um, social media managers, before 2006, Facebook, Twitter, these things didn't exist. There was something like MySpace, which does anyone remember that? Does anyone use MySpace? No one's gonna admit to it. But now social media managers are part and parcel of every company, every major airline, television network, athlete, celebrity is on, um, uh, on Twitter. Same thing with cloud computing services. All of our data is now stored in the cloud. We can take our music with us wherever we go. That wasn't a thing. Uh, digital marketing, marketing managers, search en engine optimization specialists, user experience experts, sustainability managers. If in the 90s we were worried about the rainforests, but we didn't, we didn't take seriously the threat of greenhouse gases and global warming. And now it's considered a big social faux pas if you're a major corporation and you don't have a carbon credit or a sustainability plan. So that's how much the world we're living has changed in since the, the turn of the millennium alone. What about jobs that ex will exist? 
What about waste data managers? What about who's going to deal with those, those exabytes and petabytes and yottabytes and whatever other syllables you want to throw in front of it, those, those millions of zeros of data points that don't mean anything? How, do, where, where do you, how are you going to decide what's useful and what's not? In, in researching future jobs, I really liked this one, healthcare navigator. So healthcare is becoming increasingly specialized and, incredible, and increasingly difficult to navigate. I know because I currently have a relative who's very sick in the hospital, and I go with my cousin to help interpret every time we talk to the doctor and the nurses. Um, because I know what questions to ask, because I'm treating my, my uncle, my relative, as if he's my patient. I know to ask, you know, how he's doing nutritionally in terms of his activity level, in terms of his progress, in terms of his, in his, his uh, antibiotics, um, in terms of his oxygen requirements. I know because I'm a doctor, but it shouldn't have to take 25 plus years of schooling to be able to glean discernible responses from your physician. And I think this is a very legitimate field that really needs to be opened up. What about augmented reality? Now, this has been a thing on the edge since the 1970s. And every five years, the, the, the tides of, of cyclical uh, trends will say, all right, this is the year for augmented reality. And it still hasn't happened yet. 2009 was a promising year. But uh, one of these days, augmented reality and Star Trek's holodeck will become a thing. And then there will be job cries out there for augmented reality architects. What about people who deal in alternative currencies? Bitcoin is one example of this, but what about other examples of currencies? What happens when we make our own jobs obsolete, either by um, making, replacing ourselves with robots or automated processes? Then what is it that will make us employable? It will be our, our creativity and our ingenuity. And that itself could possibly be could possibly be a form of currency. And so the list goes on and on, and I'm just presenting this to you to get your own brain juices flowing. And I want you to, as a thought experiment tonight, to ask yourself, you know, what jobs are on the horizon that don't exist today? Maybe it's a spaceship pilot. Maybe suborbital flight or private space flight will be a thing in 10 years. And, you know, kids will be saying, instead of I want to be an astronaut, I want to be a spaceship pilot. So closer to home, I'm going to take you through a couple of my own experiences now. And then we're going to tie everything up with looking at lessons learned from this case study and from the world of studies around us that we've talked about already. So I told you earlier, um, one, of, uh, one of my previous experiences, I've co-founded a company. It's called Civigard. It's a company we asked, what if a smartphone could save your life in a crisis? So basically, we've des designed a new um, emergency communication system that's smartphone-based and that's real-time. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about it. But how it came up was I took a year off from medical school and I attended Singularity University down in Silicon Valley. Um, it's based at NASA and this, this is a, it's a, a, an institution where they really encourage you to think big. And to give you an idea of how big um, they want you to think, uh, they tasked us with the challenge of positively impacting one billion people in 10 years using technology. Um, and to some that would seem like a da daunting task. But I would say when you're with the right set of people, um, in my case, I worked with a team of nine people from seven countries, you take it one step further and you say, how do you positively impact seven billion people in 10 years? What is a problem that's, that is impactful and that is affecting anyone, anywhere, anytime? And so we looked at disaster response uh, and natural disa and man-made disasters. Um, because whether you're talking about a bomb threat in Times Square in New York or hurricanes um, uh, and typhoons in the Pacific, or if you're talking about um, earthquakes in California, um, forest fires, there's not a corner of this planet that's untouched by, by disasters. At the same time, we looked at the state of disaster response, and we looked at mass messaging. It was slow, generic, failure prone, and it didn't take the adva advantage of emerging technologies. So you can see on the screen behind me, there's examples of what emergency communications was like in 2009. So either you got something that was really non-specific. Non um, so on Twitter, um, during the 2010 uh, bomb, bomb threat in Times Square, Broadway is closed between 44th and 46th Street. What does that mean? Does that mean don't go near there, take a detour, take a one-block detour? 
Similarly, if there was a gas leak here on campus and you got a message saying gas leak on campus, what does that mean? Essentially, in times of disasters, you want information and you want it specific to your circumstance. You want a policeman in your pocket that tells you what to do and where to go and how to get there. Looking at the trends of technology that existed in, this, in, the, wake of, in the face of this, this problem space, we looked at smartphones and connected devices and social media. In 2007, um, Twitter and smartphones were just emerging. 100,000 users on Twitter, 2 million or less smartphones in the world. We also looked at the exponential trends uh, related to these technologies. By 2015, uh, Twitter is projected to have over 300 million users. Today, over 500 million tweets are sent daily. Uh, smartphones, they're projected to be nearly 4 billion smartphones worldwide by next year. So these are the trends that we looked at. We looked at um, what is going to be most pervasive and most personal and allow people to connect in times of emergency. And then that's when we came up with the concept of what if a smartphone could save your life in a crisis. And so what we did is we designed a concept that allowed first responders and trusted authorities to have a back end that allowed them to, to plan out their emergency scenario. So they could take their map and they could say, here's a specific area code or zip code or uh, postal code. And this, or this is our area of interest, say quad you know, on campus, and there's been a gas leak there. And these are the people that we want to send that message out to. So we'll say, this is your information, uh, there's a gas leak on campus, and this is what you should do. You should, uh, you should evacuate quad and here are your uh, evacuation routes. And so you on your smartphone get this message saying, hey user, there's a gas leak in quad. Um, uh, here, please avoid quad and here are your evacuation routes. We piloted our, our work in Maynard, Texas, and we also got coverage from BBC. We met up with the UN's emergency telecommunications company, uh, or sorry, communications committee, and uh, also presented our work at the White House. The other lesson that really became important to us is that you really have to move fast when you want to create something new that you think will really help people out. And so in the wake of Hurricane Irene in 2011, we, we saw that there was a chance to do something simple, but that would help a lot of people. And so we created, in the space of eight hours, we, created, uh, we got our developers and created an app that um, automatically geolocated them and then said, you're in, you're in one of New York's evacuation zones, so you need to get out. And so when I was testing this out, you can see, luckily, I was on the West Coast and said, you're safe, you can remain free and remain here. So in the last half an hour that remains to us, let's talk about how you get from here to there. What are the themes that we've seen, whether you're trying to create a hoverboard or a new, new prosthetic arm or a new disaster response technology? So I want to talk about the importance of dreaming big. So one of the philosophies I live by is if you can dream it, you can do it. Impossible is nothing and nothing is impossible. And I'll say this over and over again, but really, it's all too often you're constrained by your own fears as your own, as your own first step for doing anything. So just by a show of hands, you don't have to tell me what it is, but how many of you have ever had an idea that you thought, hey, this would be a really good idea. Like, why isn't someone doing this? Or, you know, the world, this should exist. Raise your hands. Yeah. And was there an element of fear? Did you think, well, you know, I can't leave school or, you know, I can't, I don't have the finances, or what if it fails? Did anyone ever, ever have that thought? The other thing I learned in looking at how innovation comes about is you can't be passive in the world that exists around you. Um, and this goes back to that idea of just standing and being in awe, but also being critical about the in the world around you. Always ask how you can make it better and how you can build on the work of others. So when you look at a road or an automobile, ask you know, why isn't this a, why don't I have a flying car? Why don't I have a suborbital spaceship? Why don't I have a, have a hoverboard? For those of you who've seen this talk before, I have this insane problem with ketchup bottles. They're ridiculous. They, they don't, by the very design of this product, and it's true of soap bottles, shampoo bottles, that by the very design of their product, they won't allow you to access everything in it. So there's an incredible amount of waste um, wasted product. If you look in landfills and go through all the Heinz ketchup bottles, 
the amount of waste um, that is found of unused product adds up um, to tons. And so one group took it even further and said, well, why not, why not make the ketchup bottle um, better? And so anyone who's ever tried to take ketchup out of a bottle has run into this before and really tried to shake every last bit of product out of it. But it's really kind of an arduous pro process. So they said, well, why don't we just re-engineer the bottle so that there's less cohesion between ketchup and the bottle itself and allow all of the product to be accessible and all of a sudden less waste. And so rather than complaining about it, like I always do, they actually did something about it. So lesson number three, this is kind of what I took to heart when we were building Civic Art, is that the reason we have crises is because it's just a problem that hasn't had a solution yet. There's no such thing as a crisis, because every crisis is actually an opportunity in disguise, or as I like to call it, a crisitunity. So every, the, explore every idea and every avenue and ask what if, and say, okay, well, this is a problem right now, but how do I come up with a solution? This ties back to lesson number one. Never feel limited by your age or your training or station in life. If you're feeling like you have an idea, but you are giving yourself excuses, you'll, there will always be a reason to find an excuse. Well, I'm too mired in my career, or I'm too untrained, or I'm too skilled in my career to do this other thing which I don't know how to do, or I'm too young, or I'm too old, or whatever. And so to that, I would point to um, the example of Jack Andraka, who was 15 when he won the Westinghouse Science Fair uh, by creating an alternative to pancreatic cancer de detection. And so he found um, a method that was hundreds of times faster, thousands of times cheaper, and met up with a gold standard of um, the current gold standard of detecting pancreatic cancer. And why did he do this? Because he went, because he had a family friend that died of cancer, and he thought, well, there's got to be a better way, but the current way of detecting cancer meant that by the time the, you were able to detect the cancer, it spread too far and it was too late to do anything but palliative care. And so I want to underscore that these things don't come um, overnight. It also takes a lot of legwork. So he sat down, he read through over 4,000 research papers, he thought of a proposal, he learned about carbon nanotubules, and said, well, what if we had carbon nanotubules and we could use them to detect mesothelin, which is uh, a factor expressed by pancreatic tumor cells. And those carbon nanotubules are pretty cheap. So what if we used that as a method that was faster and cheaper um, compared to the current standard? And then this other, the other example I want to tell you about is about Brittany Wegner. At 17, she won the Google Science Fair Again, by just saying, well, why don't we have a better way and more accurate way of looking at breast cancer biopsies? Why can't we just uh, use an algorithm and uh, artificial intelligence to look at uh, samples from biopsies and see which ones are accurate and which ones are not, and then learn from what, what it's seeing, and then use that algorithm to create an exa a way of detecting cancer that says 99.9% .9 .9 accurate. And so at age 17, um, she, so at age 12, she had first decided to pick up a book on coding and programming and learn about AI. And then at age 17, she managed to turn that into um, a, a real world application. And so if you're feeling intimidated by that, I wanna assure you that you don't need to be a rocket surgeon to, to come up with a real world solution. That's why there's 6.9 billion people in the world um, the reason we have other disciplines and other minds and other people in the world is to figure out where your disciplines intersect and figure out where your shortcomings are and where someone else's strengths are and figure out how you can work together with your, both your assets and your team's assets to come up with an idea. So never ever feel like you have to do something alone because the, the, the power of achieving something comes together in a team and using uh, your strengths uh, to meet to meet your goals. So I've been talking about this um, throughout the talk. Learn to think exponentially. So I want to engage you in a thought experiment. What if I ask you to take 32 linear steps across the room? You would be over there if you started over there. 
Now, what if I were to ask you to take 32 exponential steps across the room, by which I mean, if you were to start with one step, then you would take two steps, then four steps, then eight steps, and so on and so forth. So by the time you reach the 32nd power of that, you'd be halfway to the moon. And so taking this thinking and applying it to, to the technology, um, it means you have to think beyond what seems here and now, and if you were to scale that factor. So looking at communication technologies, it took the radio 50 years to reach 38 million listeners. It took Facebook two years to do that because of the power of exponential reach. Lesson number seven. So this here is Dave Kelly. He's the founder of IDEA, which is uh, one of the world's leading design firms. Practice creative confidence. This is the notion that you have big ideas and that you have the ability to act on them. So. You can, there will always be a million reasons as to why you can't do something. But there will always be that one reason to do something, because you can and because you want to. Engage in design thinking. And so what exactly is this? This is a type of problem solving that looks at people and how people interact with the world around them. And so it comes down to defining a problem and learning about who is involved, the audience who engages in this problem, what their needs are. And then it just it, it comes up with creating a solution and iterating, just doing it, prototyping, creating an idea, working quickly to do it, and then just learning about your results. Just designing, put simply. Designing, testing, iterating. Lesson number nine, I think this is one of the most important uh, lessons that I've learned, and it's something I'm exploring, is know your history. So to get to where you're going, first know how you got there. Learn about the greats and learn about their mistakes. And the reason, this is new for those of you who've seen my talk before, and the reason I've put this in here is because I've recently started get, taking interest in history. I've been learning about American history and I've been through um, books on the Civil War. I've re read through 12 Years a Slave, 30 Years a Slave. Um, I've picked up a book on modern slavery. Um, and so many things fall into place, and you, you learn about why there is such um, class disparity and socioeconomic problems, looking specifically in the context of the United States, why these things exist today, because they're still trying to catch up from the incredible disparity um, that was created in the context of so, uh, slavery 200 years ago. Um, and even if you look at any common modern context or modern conflict, you can see that A, it can be explained by what came before it. Um, and then the lessons of how we failed and how we, how we succeeded in previous conflicts um, will help guide uh, our outcomes today. And so um, for those of you who are history buffs, um, you'll know that, for example, the Cold War came from the Second World War, which came from the First World War, which came from the Franco-Prussian War before it, which came, was related to, um, you, can, you can keep tra tracing it back. You can trace it back to the Industrial Revolution, to um, the, the French Revolution, to all over England. And everything's tied to it. So whether you're looking at um, the history of the automobile, or the invention of the light bulb, or conflict in war today, or whether you're looking at disparity, there's always a trail that leads up to how, um, how the world came to be. And if you're one of the few who is going to clue into those insights, you'll be far ahead of the pack and far better place to come up with a solution to those problems. Lastly, lesson number 10, embrace the Nike philosophy, just do it. Or as I like to say, shut up and do it. Because you can spend the rest of your life making excuses, or you can just act. So just to summarize the pearls, think, think big. Nothing's impossible. Always seek to make the world around you better. There's no problems, just solutions waiting to be happen. But I'm only whatever excuse is just an excuse. Never us underestimate the power of a dedicated, solid team. Stay on top of trends and technologies. And you, as a thought, sort of thought experiment with yourself, try to predict things. Try to say, where will this be uh, next year? You know, will it be the next MySpace or the next Facebook? What is the next Facebook? Practice creative confidence. 
Practice design thinking. Know your history and shut up and do it. So just to, as we wind up here, we've talked about big ideas, but let's talk about big challenges. So in our lifetime, what is there left to solve? Will we end slavery? Will we cure AIDS? Will we eradicate polio and our reliance on fossil fuels and oil? What about climate change? Have we, have we passed the tipping point or is, it, is there still hope? Have we, have we uh, emitted one too many greenhouse gases or uh, have we doomed ourselves to a planet that will uh, continue to heat up? Or is there still, is there still another alternative? Can we, what about poverty? Why do we still have this concept of the poverty, a bottom billion? Why, why do we, why is that still a thing? What about universal health care? Will we have it? Should we have it? Why aren't we on Mars yet? Can we reverse engineer the brain? Can we augment it? My job is uh, in a neurosurgery is to take out problems, to take out tumors, to uh, address traumas and infections and, and aneurysms. What if my job description changed? What if my job could be to augment the brain? What if I could tinker with your brain and suddenly give you a photographic memory? Should that be a thing? Will we solve aging? Is that even a thing to be solved? Is that ethical? Just some food for thought. So as we close up here, I want you to come away really feeling that this is the age of you, you as creator, because whatever you want to do, you are empowered now more than ever to do it. Whether you want to be an amateur filmmaker, there's YouTube. Whether you want to be a podcaster, there's SoundCloud. If you want to raise funds for your project, there's Kickstarter. If you want to develop or if you want to hack something, if you want to hack hardware, there's Arduino, there's Raspberry Pi, there's uh, Google Glass. If you want to learn about anything for free, there's the massive on open online courseware movement where through Coursera, through Udacity, through edX, you can learn. You could take university courses for free. There's Khan Academy. We talked about Makey Makey earlier. I have some homework for you. So the first thing I want you to do as you walk out of here, as you walk out of this building or out of this classroom, is just stop and look at the world and say, what is different about this? Could I design, if I could design one thing to be better, what would I design? You know, should this, should this be a building with smart sensors that could automatically adjust the temperature? Um, should the walls be able to shift in order to accommodate higher flow of students? Is that, should that be a thing? For one day this week, try taking a pad of paper and everywhere you go in the world, every, as you note inefficiencies, take them down, take that piece of paper and jot, that pencil and jot them down. What are three big challenges within your own field? And then if you want to learn more about invention, innovation, and design thinking, I've uh, included some links here. And then pick your, pick your hero. Figure out what made them tick, whether it's Bill Gates or Da Vinci or Edison. It could be as simple as wikipedia -ing them. The part that what I want you to walk out of here with is that you are empowered, and it starts now with you. So in case you forgot, three things I want you to walk out of here today. It is an amazing time to be alive. This now is the age of discovery, and there's never been a better time to be a creator. So I'm just gonna give you some parting advice from people who've inspired me. What, um, so above you can see George Bernard Shaw, Steve Jobs, Dean Kamen, and Peter Diamandis, founder of the XPRIZE Foundation. Ask those fairy tale what if questions. Stay hungry and foolish, because today, tomo today's crazy guys might be tomorrow's breakthrough. And my, one of my favorite quotes from Dean Kamen is, when embarking upon an idea, ask yourself, is it crazy? The answer should be yes. If it works, will it be a really big deal? And look at the world and don't think why, but ask why not? Because progress depends on the unquestioning individual, uh, not on the unquestioning individual, but on the unreasonable ones who dares to ask those questions. So any questions? I was recently reading one of Brett Wilson's book and his biggest regret was not spending time with his family and just focusing on his career, his company, his development. Which, which book was that? Uh, Brett Wilson's. Brett Wilson, what was it called? Um, Still Making Mistakes. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's a really good point. Um, and that goes for any field you're in. 
you'll always have to, you'll always have to seek work-life balance. And I think the best advice I ever got on that was that there's no such thing as balance. There is what is important today versus what will be important tomorrow. Um, and in medicine, I mean, certainly, even if we're not innovating and being entrepreneurs, we certainly deal with balance all the time. And I think regardless of whatever field you're in, it's, it's um, I don't think it's specific to entrepreneurs or CEOs or, or high net worth indiv individuals. I think every single person this, in this planet has to deal with the question of balance and, and what's important and what values they hold true. At Singularity University, I'm wondering about tips to make a great team. Oh, yeah. Uh, so like you basically started a startup and you're a medical doctor, so that sounds very challenging. And so also having a team to uh, like be able to design an app, say with your, with your sort of expertise in medicine and other people's expertise in computer science. Do you have any tips on making That's this team? That's a really team? good question. That's actually probably one of the best questions I've ever gotten. Um, tips on making a team. So um, experience, um, work with lots of different teams. Um, so before I came to Singularity University, I was convinced that it was all about people power because when I was at the Space University, our team was 30 people big, and you know I thought that was the only way to get a th something done. Um, but has anyone here ever been on a group project where they've had to essentially take on the work of the entire team? Or I guess that doesn't happen. Um, so I, I, for a while I dreaded teamwork, but going through more teams, um, I learned that having people from a large variety of disciplines, because I'm hopelessly non-technical, I don't code, but people on my team did, or they knew how to, um, how to get a hold of developers. Experience comes down to a large part of it. Um, multidisciplinary, and then work ethic. It always has to come down to work ethic, because you know if you all want to just be there for maybe you know, seven, eight hours a day, um, maybe you're not, you, maybe you'll have fun, but maybe you won't get to where you want with your, your project. So uh, I'd say those are the top three things. 